Okay, so now what we're going to do is I'm going to I'm going to talk about application of phase diagrams to the making of champagne because champagne relies on phase diagrams. So, um, and then, and then I'm going to make some general comments, but I'm going to actually show you some champagne. So before I get into my commentary, I'm going to get some champagne chilling. So first I have to show you how to chill champagne. First, I will show you how not to chill champagne. This is how not to chill champagne. And it's not because, I, okay, we can put it in there. Why? Because, as I showed you last day, with respect to the cooling of the engine coolant by the radiator, if you have, if this is the bottle here, this is the bottle, here's the contents, the precious contents, and I have this with blocks of ice, the content, the contact between the ice and the bottle is sporadic and I've got air in between so the quality of the cooling is very poor so instead what I do is I rely on the phase diagram I rely on the phase diagram so what do I do you see I, what do I know about the phase diagram if I pour water in here I will thermostat the entire system liquid plus solid at zero degrees because the ice is probably I don't know minus three minus four Celsius but the air is 20 and it gets in there and it's very few atoms it's crummy heat transfer instead if I flood this with water the whole thing is thermostated at zero degrees C so now I've got a good delta T because I started here at about 22 degrees C I've got a delta T and it's a fixed law right it's going to be what it's going to be the flux the, the heat flux is going to be minus thermal conductivity dt by dx it's Fickian type motion of the of thing so let's do it so we now this is how you properly chill I'm told it also works for soda and fruit juices this technique I mean but I, I, I do know that it works with champagne now that's working beautifully. I can just feel the heat being extracted. Okay, so now let's, let's talk about champagne. All right, so we're going to talk about champagne and a great inventor, and the inventor is the widow Clicquot. This is Veuve Clicquot champagne, and Veuve is the French for widow. So Veuve Clicquot, uh, her real name was Nicole Barbe Ponsardin, and in 1798 she married Francois Clicquot. This was a big uh, French winemaking family, and he died and left her a widow at the age of 27. She was very unusual for a French woman in the 18th century because they were not involved in, in society. They were certainly not involved in business. This woman was different. She decided to get under the hood and she took control of the winery. And I've, I've written here Bold Imaginative Ma Management. There's a fantastic book about her. It's actually a very good book portraying uh, late 18th century, early 19th century France. And these are among her accomplishments, marketed champagne to all the great courts of Europe. Champagne was a regional beverage, drunk only in the Champagne region. And she created the myth, propagated the myth of champagne. You, you use it for festive occasions, bought land in the best vineyards, quality control. It's about the chemistry. Huh? Fought fiercely against counterfeiting. As she started getting champagne more recognition, people started making sparkling wine and labeling it as champagne. She used the court system to take them down establish strict quality control procedures that's all about defending the brand and what's the quality control it's the chemistry produce the first rosé champagne the Pinot Noir grape has a black skin but you press and then you take the juice and away you go what she does she let the the skin sit with the juice for long enough to give it just a rosé tinge and then oversaw the invention of new technology remouillage and that's where the phase diagrams come into play Phase diagrams give us champagne that we enjoy today. So what's the problem? Champagne is cloudy. And why is it cloudy? Well, here's the chemistry. Here's how you make, this is how you make all wine. It's a one-stop shopping. You take the grape. The grape has sugar in it, in the grape juice, and yeast that attacks the sugar is in the skin. So the yeast attacks the sugar to make alcohol and CO2. So ethyl alcohol and CO2 plus some insolubles there are some insoluble products of that reaction and there's two types of insolubles those that will settle they're called sedimentary and those that won't settle they're called suspended and how do you get rid of the sedimentary stuff by mechanical separation you let the you let the the, the juice sit 
this reaction's taking place, and the sedimentary stuff is turning into gunk, and it sits at the bottom. And then, periodically, you siphon. You siphon the juice off, and you leave all the crud at the bottom of the barrel, and then you go for a few more months, and then you siphon again. Well, that works for the sedimentary stuff, um, but it won't work for champagne, because as you're siphoning, you're letting out all the gas. You see, you're trapping this gas. That's, uh, the champagne has CO2 that's naturally occurring. It's not carbonated. It's carbonated naturally. It's not carbonated man-made carbonation. It's natural carbonation. So how do you separate the juice from the crud without losing the gas? That's the problem. And by the way, the, the, the other stuff that's, that's suspended, they use tricks. You know, here's the free body diagram. Remember I showed you this for milk? So what they do is add things like eggshell, and the eggshell acts as a coagulant, so all the tiny particles that will float agglomerate to become big enough that then they'll settle. Tiny particles of a given density will float. Large particles of the same density will sink. So you, you, you need to coagulate. And do that without spoiling the taste. It's fantastic chemistry. So she comes along with the answer. By the way, the early champagne glasses were all cut crystal. Why were they cut crystal? Because the champagne was cloudy. It tasted fantastic, but who wanted to? It looked like swill. So how to make it clear? So what they did is they made champagne bottles with the deep ruts, and they still do to this day. They have the deep rut here, because the idea was if you opened it carefully, you wouldn't disturb so much of the crud. But it, it gets churned up by the gas. So what she reasoned is, let's turn them upside down, and let's have the crud settle on the underside of the cork. And furthermore, 45 degrees is the optimal angle. You know this from your Newtonian mechanics. And then you turn them, so you, you spiral the bottles turn them and have all the crud collect on the underside of the cork. I know you're, what you're thinking. You say, well, how are you going to get the cork out? And now you take the cork out, you're going to lose not just the gas, you're going to lose the liquid too. Ah, that's where the phase diagrams come in. So here's the phase diagram of ethanol water. And it's a eutectic. It's a eutectic. Look at way down here. In fact, ethanol makes a really good antifreeze. Look, a little bit of, you go way down here. Now, most wines are somewhere between 10 and 15 percent alcohol that gives you very modest freezing point depression, maybe about minus 5 Celsius, which is why if you forget, you put a wine bottle in the freezer, and you forget about it, and you've got your freezer really cranked to, say, minus 5 Fahrenheit, you'll freeze the wine, and it'll expand because it's 90 percent water and push the cork out and make a mess. So, but remember, that you only get down to about minus 5. Remember I showed you this one? It gets down to minus 21. So what she reasoned was, what if you took the bottle upside down, you've got all the crud on the underside of the cork, what if you took the bottle and put it into not water, but what if I put sodium chloride in here? I still have my ice cubes, only the temperature is now minus 21. And that's below the freezing point of the alcohol, and now I've frozen an ice plug in the neck. So now there's an ice plug between the crud and the cork. So now I can turn the bottle like this, just melt ever so slightly, and the pressure in the bottle will blow the ice plug, take with it the crud out, and then I quickly put the cork on the top. And that's how every bottle of champagne is made. And it all comes from these phase diagrams. See? So you put it in brine, eh, minus 21, but this thing is frozen already. That red is frozen. And now I turn it right side up, and poof, out it goes, takes the crud with it, and put the cork back on. So it's the combination of this phase diagram, this phase diagram, both eutectic phase diagrams that give us clear champagne. Positively brilliant. Positively brilliant. So there it is. This is the, the invention. Um, and, uh, oh, by the way, uh, th th they call this, uh, uh, the, the English word for remouillage is, is riddling. So they have people that actually go, and they, th th these wooden racks with the slots in them at 45 degree angles, and all these bottles uh, pointed downward at 45 degree angle. The guys come in every day, took, 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 quarter turn, quarter turn, quarter turn. French are very traditional. Few champagne wineries have motorized, so they have this thing called giro palette, which is a gyrating palette. The, the California champagne wineries call it VLM, very large machine. <laughs> I kid you not, I didn't make that up. In California, the giro palette is called VLM, which is very large machine, dude, I guess. That's what they say <laughs> in California. All right. So now, let's see. I think it's time to 
open up the uh, champagne. So first thing, we have to teach you how to open champagne. So there's, a, there's the foil here, so we'll take the foil off. We'll take the foil off very carefully. And then there's the wire basket that keeps the, uh, keeps the cork on. How many turns on the wire basket? Everyone in 3091 knows. Six turns. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six. Six turns. Okay. And so now I don't want to point that at anybody because the only thing between me and six atmospheres pressure is that cork. All right. And Dave, if we can cut to the to the document camera, the the, the cover, the, the metal cover on this has the image of the widow Clicquot. This is Viv Clicquot, and this is the image of, of the Viv, and she's on every bottle. She was the one that gave us clarified champagne, so you, you thank her very much. All right, now, <laughs> so now we're going to do is we're going to open this thing. To open it, we point it 45 degrees and turn it ever so slightly. Never point it at people. Point, no, really, point it away. You, you put, put an eye out with this thing. You turn it very slightly, actually. My hands are wet now, so I'm going to use a towel here. Just <laughs> oh, yeah. No. Go like this. I like the suspense. Huh? <laughs> See that? No. That's for football locker rooms. This is very de classe. Okay. And now we have to have we have to have a glass. So since we have clarified champagne, we're not going to use cut crystal. We're going to use baccarat, French crystal that's not cut. Because we've got nothing to hide. All right. So now we're going to pour this. And the rut now has some value. The rut has value because now what you can do is to pour it like so. Okay, so now we're I've been waiting 14 weeks for this. <laughs> All right, so the surface tension, you see the carbon dioxide outgassing because it's supersaturated. Six atmospheres, now one atmosphere. The bubbles are nucleating on the defects in the, in the glass. <laughs> it's all about chemistry. So there we go. Okay, so, so I'm going to uh, propose a toast to the class. To the, to the 3091 class of fall 2009, to wish you much success in your academic pursuits and much happiness in your personal lives. And uh, with that, I'm going to find out what's going on inside. Um, <laughs> look at those bubbles. You know, the, the, the legend is the, the blind monk, Dom Perignon, when he first drank champagne, said, I feel as though I'm drinking stars. He's right. <laughs> Drinking stars. Okay, this is to you.